and welcome to our final um, airline keynote sp speaker uh, today. And um, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by, I think, probably the one of the most active airlines during the course of this uh, crisis, uh, Qatar Airlines Group. It, the they've just uh, in the past few days moved up to a hundred uh, destinations in their network. They've restored since the crisis, and um, to give us far more details on. on the journey they've been on and the challenges they faced. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Group Chief Executive, His Excellency Akbar al uh, Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by thanking Flight Global for their invitation to deliver the airline CEO keynote address. It is truly a privilege to have the opportunity to speak to this wide audience, and I truly hope that we will be able to see each other in person very soon. I know it is not the normal time. Unfortunately, we have to uh, speak to each other through uh, WebEx or video conferencing. So we really are hoping to come back to the, the normal times that we are so used to meeting people and interacting with each other. I also want to acknowledge the great work and dedication of Flight, Flight Global team in organizing this important summit. Uh, to say that we live in exceptional and challenging times seems to be a wholly inadequate way to explain the impact that this pandemic has on our lives. As we know it, including our country's economies and the way we do business, and people-to-people -people exchanges across the globe. Aviation industry has never faced a challenge at this scale and magnitude, with the long-term consequences of this crisis upon our industry still to be determined. Over the course of just a few short months, we saw a decline in international air travel of almost 95% and a global reduction in seat capacity of 87% compared to the same period of 2019. While each airline has tackled the pandemic differently, today I'm proud to give you an insight on Qatar Airways' role and efforts during the course of this crisis, highlight the measures the UK market needs to implement, as well as a vision for the future of the aviation industry. While other airlines grounded their aircraft, leaving millions of passengers stranded worldwide, we continued flying, though temporarily reducing the scale of our operations and did everything we can to work with authorities and embassies from across the world to continue to help the skies, to, to continue to keep the skies open and help people to return to their homes. Taking people home safely and reliably became a fundamental mission, with my teams working around the clock to coordinate relief efforts, not only to uh, keep flying to existing destinations within our network, but also to cities where Qatar Airways has never flown before. By continuing to fly during the pandemic while others stopped, we have earned the trust of passengers as the airline they can rely on. Our network has never fallen below 30 destinations or over 150 weekly flights. By the end of 2020, we plan to rebuild our network towards 125 destinations. And just last week, we reached the important milestone of 100 destinations. There are still millions of uh, people who have not seen their friends and families for months and a growing network will allow them to travel home, to take a trip, to see loved ones, support and supporting the critical passenger movements. During the peak months of the pandemic, Qatar Airways became the largest international carrier. We have flown over 170 million kilometers to repatriate more than 2.3 million passengers on over 37,000 flights during the crisis. The airline has also worked closely with governments and companies around the world to operate over 400 relief flights 
to help repatriate over 120,000 people. At one point, our flights accounted for 17.8% of international passenger traffic, according to IATA numbers, over triple our nearest competitor and more than the next four airlines combined. Turning to the vital role air cargo has played in the context of COVID-19 outbreak, this part of the industry has been hugely important for the quick deliveries of essential goods, medicines, medical equipment, PPE, and other supplies. Air cargo's ability to quickly respond and adapt to the changing environment, swiftly deploying passenger aircraft for cargo-only operations to avoid a shortage of supply, quickly positioned it as the world's largest air freight operator. While other cargo operators have seen declines due to COVID-19, Qatar Airways cargo operations have actually grown compared to the same period last year, hitting new records of over 180 dedicated cargo flights in a single day. Back in February, a convoy of five Qatar Airways cargo freighters departed to China carrying approximately 300 tons of medical supplies donated by the airline to support COVID-19 relief efforts in that country. The five flights departed one after the other, bound for Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, as part of Qatar Airways' voluntary offer of free air cargo transportation for medical relief aid to fight the coronavirus emergency. In total, the airline has transported more than 250,000 tons of essential supplies and medical aid around the world since the start of the pandemic. Since July 2020 and until the end of December 2020, charities will be able to use the services of Qatar Airways Cargo to transport medical equipment, humanitarian relief, and essential products to where they are most needed free of charge. The 1 million kilos campaign is the first chapter in an ambitious sustainability project called We Care. Though this in, through this initiative, Qatar Airways Cargo is playing an important active role in building tomorrow's world. The recovery of international travel will take time, but the resumption of our 100th destination, Sofia, Bulgaria on the 16th October was a significant milestone for us. Restoring passenger confidence is crucial to the recovery and we are proud to be offering one of the most flexible and generous booking policies, reassuring passengers that the industry recognizes the challenges of booking travel in the current climate and providing them peace of mind with such policies is crucial to the recovery. I would call on all airlines to take every possible step to rebuild confidence with passengers so the industry moves towards a quicker recovery. Despite the best efforts of airlines, significant impediments remain slowly the sustainable restart, slowing the sustainable restart and the recovery of the aviation sector. The most common concern raised by our passengers is the difficulty they are having an understanding entry and exit requirements of different countries, placing airlines in the precarious position of trying to give certainty to our passengers in a constantly changing regulatory environment. In addition to the constant changes with travel restrictions, we have the lack of uniformity of global standards. The patchwork of regulations we navigate on a daily basis while trying to operate scheduled and non-scheduled services is similar to a bureaucratic minefield. We have had numerous regulations changed or no terms issued mid-flight and or with immediate effect. This approach resulted in passengers being stranded at various airports, forcing us to incur additional costs to find a solution to ensure passengers get to their final destinations again putting pressure on airlines in this very difficult time. 
All of these varying regulations create a logistical nightmare for carriers, and it only highlights the need for consistent global regulatory guidelines for the aviation sector. International bodies such as IATA and ICAO need to work with governments to establish and formalize harmonized regulatory guidelines so airlines can operate with certainty and focus on the business of flying rather than navigating red tape. As one of the most highly regulated industries, the future of aviation is very much dependent on the foresight of, go of governments and regulatory bodies around the world. Will governments continue to move towards a liberalized aviation environment, or will they become cautious and fall back on protectionism? Already there are calls to limit the ability of international airlines to freely carry passengers between destinations. I'm sure you know what I mean. Countries creating bubbles, which is just another way of protecting home carriers at the cost of international free travel and open skies. The advocates of such approach usually base their argument on protecting jobs or maintaining labor standards. But what they are really asking is for governments to stop passengers for making their own choice. This is never a successful strategy. The aviation industry has to become more responsive to consumer, to consumer demand, not less. We, as in the, we, as an industry, have achieved a certain level of liberalization. Though still far from enough, but now we might witness more protectionism in the post-COVID-19 era, and ultimately it will be the passengers who will pay the price. I believe that travel will steadily return, limited by entry restrictions rather than consumer confidence. People will want to travel again, experience the world, meet friends and family, as well as business travel restarting. In many ways, the restrictions have made people realize how precarious the ability to travel really is and was perhaps taken for granted. I am confident air travel demand will return to pre-COVID-19 levels in the next three to four years especially once a vaccine and a, a, a proven vaccine is developed. Passenger confidence will return and people will be more willing to travel once they have confidence in such a vaccine. It is part of the human spirit to explore and visit new places. And once we have overcome this pandemic, the desire will remain and international travel will recover. Of course, it would be remiss of me not to touch on the ongoing illegal air and sea blockade imposed on my home country. While the illegal blockade has been ongoing for more than three years, we should never allow these illegal actions to be normalized. Threats to the safety and normalcy of international civil aviation should never be an acceptable tool for political posturing and the international community must not allow the current actions to set a precedent for using freedom of navigation as a weapon to harm a country and its people. In July this year, we welcome the judgment of the International Court of Justice, affirming that the ICAO Council has the jurisdiction to hear any disagreement relating to the interpretation and implementation of the Chicago Convention of 1944 and the international Air Services Transit Agreement. We look forward to observing the return of the State of Qatar to Montreal to urge the ICAO Council to condemn the illegal airspace blockade and to take appropriate actions to require the four blockading states to comply with their obligations under international law in order to restore the normalcy of international civil aviation. At Qatar Airways, we firmly believe that travel is the right for all, and that this world is all of us to explore. And now let us shine the light on the United Kingdom. For the UK to remain the third best connected country in the world, and in order to support the local aviation industry, strong government support is needed. 
As many of you are aware, airport-based COVID-19 PCR testing is now available in more than 30 countries globally, including some of the world's busiest airports. Introducing this measure across UK airports, followed by a five-day quarantine on arrival into the UK, offers a balance between protecting public health and increasing demand for air travel. By introducing a similar robust testing regime across UK airports, the current 14 days quarantine process can be replaced. In the absence of a vaccine, PCR testing at airports for inbound passengers remain the most, the most reliable process to resume international travel. And keeping in mind that now tests are available that can be done quickly, efficiently, and in as little as 15 minutes. In Qatar, nationals and resident permit holders are allowed to allowed to enter into the country and depending on whether they have returned from a low or high risk destination the appropriate quarantine measures are put in place all passengers entering doha through hamad international airport are thermally screened asked to download a mobile app that monitors individual's health status requested to complete a health assessment form as well as sign a quarantine commitment agreement. Those returning from low cost, uh, from low risk countries are automatically tested at the airport before they can proceed to their seven day home quarantine. It usually takes 24 hours to receive the results. A secondary test is conducted on the sixth day. And if these results are found to be negative, they're cleared to leave the quarantine the next day. Passengers from high risk countries are required to book at one of the approved quarantine hotels prior to their arrival to Doha, which they are then transported to upon completing the necessary arrival procedures at the airport. They are required to quarantine in the hotel for a week, after which they either commit to home quarantine for an additional week if they test negative or are transferred to a medical facility if they test positive. I believe integrating and adapting similar initiatives will be key to the future success of the UK aviation market. On a separate note, let me address the APD based on recent studies carried out by York Aviation and commissioned by the Airlines UK, the Industry Association for UK Registered Airlines, a 12-month 12 12 air passenger duty waiver would save 45% of the lost jobs, the lost air routes, and potentially 8,000 jobs over the next 12 months. It would also increase passenger demand and enable the sector to stimulate an additional £7 billion in economic activity. Global airline connectivity is crucially important for any country, especially an island like the United Kingdom to keep it connected to global trade and commerce, especially at difficult times like these. Every effort must be made to remain flexible in terms of entry restrictions and encourage passengers to travel by simplifying the process and reducing red tape. If, if I now look to the future, our vision for aviation focuses on a strategic investment in fuel-efficient twin-engine aircraft, such as the Airbus A350 and the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, which strike the perfect balance of passenger and belly hold freight capacity. It is becoming clear that more and more customers are taking environmental concerns into consideration when they are making their purchasing decisions. We have seen this already in the automotive industry with the shift towards electrification and aviation needs to also move towards a more sustainable model. During this crisis, the A350 in particular has grown to become the workhorse of our fleet, operating to key strategic routes in Africa, the Americas, Asia Pacific, and Europe. Recognizing early the shift in customer sentiments towards sustainability we have, seen proact we have been proactive in ensuring we operate the latest, most fuel-efficient aircraft. 
We were the launch customer for both the Airbus A350-900 and the A350-1000. We are the largest operator of the A350, A350 family of aircraft with 49 aircraft in total in our fleet. It is clear the future of, environment, of international aviation is twin engine aircraft and this crisis has shown the value of mixed fleet. Many airlines like British Airways and Qantas have already removed their 747s from service, while others, including ourselves, have grounded the Airbus A380. Unfortunately, some airlines have been forced to unsustainably operate oversized aircraft, creating excessive emis emissions and dumping capacity. Our mix of modern fuel-efficient aircraft has kept us sustainable and agile, able to deploy the right-sized aircraft to offer sensible capacity and optimal frequencies to passengers so passengers can travel when they want. We recently ben benchmarked the Airbus A380 to the Airbus A350 on routes from Doha to London, Guangzhou, Frankfurt, Paris, Melbourne, Sydney, New York and Toronto, and the results were astonishing. We found that on a typical one-way flight, the Airbus A350 aircraft saved a minimum of 16 tons of CO2 block hour compared to the Airbus A380. The analysis also found that the Airbus A380 emitted over 80% more carbon dioxide per block hour than the Airbus A350 on each of these routes. Sustainable fuel efficient fleets will be key to not only surviving this current crisis, but also essential to the future success of airlines. However, an airline you all know that we do not man however, as an airline you all know that we do not manufacture aircraft or build engines. While we commit and strive to be more sustainable, our ability to meet our targets is very much dependent on the aircraft and engine manufacturers and petrochemical companies. Airbus, Boeing, General Electric, Rolls-Royce and other suppliers need to reinvest their profits in R&D and innovation to achieve greater efficiency. Similarly, the petrochemical companies need to develop fuels that are more efficient and invest in alternatives such as biofuels. While we can continue to push manufacturers to invest in new technology and develop more environmentally sustainable solutions, the final decisions lies with them. The future of the industry will depend on everyone working together to achieve this sustainable vision. I would like to thank you all for being here today and for the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Al-Bakar. Um, I think we have time for just a couple of questions, if you, if that's okay. Um, and, and one of them, sort of tie in one of mine and, and one that came in, which refers to the A380. Um, not brought that aircraft back uh, yet. Do you see a long-term future, or what would you need to see uh, you demand-wise for you to bring back the A380? And if you operated on the London route, um, what are your plans for the London route if, if it's not with an A380? Uh, well, I don't think that the A380 will uh, get back into the skies in the short term. The, the growth rate will have to be uh, the growth rate we achieved in 2019 for us to consider the A380. And people who want to fly the A380 sooner than uh, getting back uh, to the pre-2019 uh, levels, I think will be very foolish. There will not be the kind of demand. And if the demand starts growing and people start deploying the A380, you'll only be able to achieve this by dumping uh, the price. And once you dump the price, you become unsustainable. You now need to really focus on recovering the, the losses that uh, the airlines have created. We don't think that we are going to operate our A380s for at least the next couple of years. 
And um, on that London route, um, the, uh, uh, the question specifically is, would, would he consider putting first class in the A350s? No, we will uh, not put first class in uh, our A350s. Actually, it is not required. Uh, the product we are offering in the Q suite is actually more superior to most of the first class uh, of many airlines. And then it's interesting, you, you, as you say, you're at 100 uh, uh, routes to the network now and this ambition to get to 125 by the end of the year. But the question on the floor is, with, with the second wave of COVID evident, how, how is that impacting Qatar's strategy and how, how optimistic are you of achieving that? You can already see that we are at 100 destinations whilst by the middle of October, we were planning to be 125 destinations. The second wave of uh, the COVID infection in Europe and many other airlines, many other airports around the world and many other countries have started to extend the airport closure uh, has uh, delayed our plans to the end of December. We hope that uh, in the next four weeks with the uh, precautions already being taken by many of the countries where the, the wave the second wave is strong, that uh, uh, the infection rates will start coming down and people will have the confidence and the airports and the countries will have the confidence to open up uh, their airports so that we will be able to again achieve the numbers we achieve. But it all depends. I don't want to put the horse in front of the cart. Uh, I don't want to put the cart in front of ho horse, I mean. We have to wait and see how the airports uh, will open and allow us to start operating to those destinations. And then just lastly, obviously you're operating to, to various parts of the world. Are there any markets that are more encouraging than others? Are there any reasons for optimism? I will not tell you that because then I will give my competition uh, <laughs> a, a head up on uh, uh, where we are operating and making better revenues.